that proteins and RNAs has uh, traits and the impact of genetic variation. So I want to show you three things. First, very briefly, how do we do QTL mapping? And then an application to protein uh, QTLs and the second application to an RNA QTL study where we were using RNA sequencing. But this study has much higher statistical power than the other studies that you've seen so far. So that is also quite interesting. Um, so, we use random forest. If you've been here since the first day with the dream challenge, then you may have noticed that random forest is really the most popular machine learning method for supervised learning. And so I don't think it comes as a surprise that we're using it. What's maybe surprising is only that not everybody else is using it for QTL mapping. Um, so I think I, I'll skip the details. It's a, um, you, you're learning regression trees, essentially, and uh, so you use the genetic markers to explain, um, for instance, expression or whatever your trait is. That means you, um, you're you using a marker to split your population into subpopulations that are more homogeneous with respect to the trait, and then you can use other markers to uh, yeah, split your population more and more. And then what's, in the end, um, important is that you're growing thousands of these decision trees, which gives you uh, more stable results, and then and then uh, we are simply using the number of times that a marker was used in this forest as an indicator of how important is this marker for your trade. Okay, this is very simple. Um, this has a lot of benefits. It's a very intuitive uh, method. You don't have to show any equation. That's important. Um, it's very robust, as I was saying, but maybe the most important aspect is that um, y you can account for epistatic effects. And that's, I think, the main difference compared to the Lasso method that you saw before, because Lasso can only account for additive effects, and as you will see, epistasis is really important. So in this paper, which was uh, published um, three years ago, we did, I think, the first, really the first assessment of QTL mapping methods using real data. Everything else before was based on simulations, and that's, of course, very dangerous because when you do your simulation, you have some assumptions, and then, of course, your method will agree with assumptions that you make. And so I think this is a more objective way of uh, comparing QTL mapping methods. And the, the uh, most important take-home message here is not that random forest is better than Lasso, but the most important conclusion is really the poor performance of this traditional single marker mapping methods. And this has been confirmed by others in the meantime, so you should really move away from using single marker mapping methods and should go, you should go more to these multi-marker mapping methods like Lasso or Random Forest, otherwise you really get the, the wrong QTLs. Um, in fact, this I think could inspire a new dream challenge where we're using real QTL data to compare QTL mapping methods. So maybe we're going to do this next year. Um, since then, we have used this in a number of applications. Uh, for instance, we have already participated in a dream challenge, but this was using uh, simulated data. And uh, then we had a, a range of different also improvements of the random forest method itself, which I think uh, will be very valuable for the machine learning community as a whole. For instance, how to extract um, model information out of the random forest, with, which has been a really hard problem in the past, or um, incorporating other um, splitting rules which we're doing down here, which is also uh, very interesting. Okay, so first application uh, to protein data. This was a really very good collaboration between uh, my postdoc, Mathieu Clément-Zizat, and Paula Picotti from the group of Rudy Ebersort at the ETH. And uh, he will be using the technologies developed by Rudy for measuring protein levels in a cross of uh, budding yeast strains. Uh, this cross was generated by Rachel Bram when she was working with uh, Leonid Krugliak. You may have seen publications coming from this cross. This is the data. It's based on targeted proteomics, so we can very reproducibly, very precisely measure proteins in many samples, and this is really crucial for QTL studies. And this is the, um, the resulting data matrix. So here you have the, the samples, the strains, and in the rows you have the proteins, and the white spots are the missing data. So you see we have very few missing data, and this is uh, this is really an important innovation because with uh, traditional shotgun proteomics you wouldn't get this. Precision of the data is also very important because it gave us very high statistical power. Um, and then this is the re resulting QTL, uh, protein QTL map, if you like. So the circles here are proteins, triangles are loci. If they're connected, you have a QTL, so this locus is affecting the protein level of this protein. 
And then the yellow um, lines are interactions between the proteins. So we also did some network analysis, but I'm, I'm skipping this because of the interest of time. Um, here I want to emphasize the difference between the red and the blue lines. Red are aesthetic interactions, blue lines are normal interactions. So with, uh, for instance, with lasso or other approaches, you you may or may not find these aesthetic interactions. It depends a bit on your on your power, but with random forest, you definitely have um, a better means of finding uh, these epistatic interactions. And now this is, I think, the most important um, take home message for the uh, systems genetics community here, because one third of all the QTLs that we found are epistatic. And that's a scary message. It's really scary, because if you remember the first slide that Manolis was showing, here we are looking at the lowest level of a complexity. We're looking at single molecules. Now these proteins are interacting in pathways. The pathways are interacting inside the cell. Cells are interacting in the tissue. So what does that mean for the um, high-level complex traits that we're really interested in, the disease traits? How many epistatic interactions do we have to expect there? And what does it mean for designing the studies and our ability to even find these associations? I think that's uh, quite scary. Uh, we had a second observation that was interesting for um, the evolutionary side of this business because uh, we found this module down here the, what we call the B1, B2 module that's controlling uh, amino acid biosynthesis and all the proteins in this module are affected by at least one QTL, but importantly they are different, different QTLs that are uh, controlling this, um, this pathway and we could show that these different uh, variants here keep the pathway in a homeostatic um, a state in the different um, parental strains, meaning that there has been positive selection at different loci, which I think was quite interesting. So the, the last example that I want to show you is uh, related to RNA sequencing, as I was saying. Um, this is using a different uh, species, fission yeast in this case. Uh, fission yeast is in fact a much better model for uh, metazoan cells for several reasons. And this is the first cross in the species that is suitable for doing QTL studies. So I think this will be a very good resource for the fission yeast community. This was a, a very good collaboration with uh, Jörg Bela at UCL and Chris Workman at the DTU. Okay, so this is the, uh, the results. This is a QTL matrix. Uh, we haven't seen that yet, so I'm going to explain this. This is the uh, fission yeast genome. Um, it only has three chromosomes, so chromosome one, two, and three. And um, so on this axis, we have the variants, and on this axis, we have the genes whose expression is affected by these variants, okay? And when you have a dot, it means that, uh, whatever here, this locus is affecting the expression of this gene here. You have the cis band. Uh, so Mindy was explaining the cis EQTLs. These are uh, local QTLs. And then everything outside of the cis band are trans EQTLs. And on top here, you have uh, growth traits that are affected by these variants. And you see this matrix is quite dense. So we found thousands of uh, EQTLs. Um, this is probably the EQTL study with the highest power, statistical power ever published for various reasons, including, including of course, the, um, the precision of RNA sequencing. Okay, we, uh, because we did RNA sequencing, we could do a, a number of fancy things. We could look at non-coding RNA. Uh, we could, uh, of course, correlate this with the growth traits. And then there's an uh, uh, important detail here that uh, in, in the lab strain that we were crossing, there is an inversion on chromosome one. And this, of course, has a strong impact on the expression of many genes. Um, but we could, um, yeah, and then we, we looked at the non-coding RNAs, and uh, we had several thousand non-coding RNAs. Um, but the important thing is that most of them were affected by an EQTL, which is interesting, but I think what's even more interesting is that also very many of these non-coding RNAs are in fact causal. So we detected that uh, about as the, the fraction of uh, um, non-coding genes causing EQTLs is as high as the fraction of coding genes causing uh, EQTLs. And this also emphasizes that we have to really look at non-coding genes and what they're doing. And by the way, this also emphasizes the importance of fission yeast because in budding yeast, uh, you don't have the uh, microRNA pathways. Um, then we looked at antisense expression, which is also quite interesting. So our uh, library preparation was maintaining the strand information of the, the reads. So we could look at the antisense transcription. And you see that in, in this cross, we also have a strong effect of genetic variation of anti on antisense transcription. And then, of course, there's this one locus over here, which is affecting a huge number of, of genes, sense and antisense. So we looked more into this. 
uh, this is probably the strongest transband ever reported. So this is a quarter of the efficient yeast genome that is affected by this by this locus. Um, so at this locus, there's a gene uh, called SWC5, which essentially, and in, in the, the other, this is the wild isolate, not the lab strain. In the strain, there's essentially a knockout. There's a frame shift very early in the gene, and then you have an early stop codon. So basically, um, a gene doesn't exist in this Y36 strain. And this gene uh, is important for the deposition of the H2AZ uh, histone variant. And this H2AZ histone, again, is important for uh, controlling uh, read-through transcription and um, bidirectional transcription. And uh, so we did a number of uh, validation experiments that I, I don't have time to go into. Uh, one of the most important experiments was uh, ChIP-seq of the H2AZ histone in these different strains. Uh, so blue is the lab strain, the one which with the uh, functional SWC5, and red is the um, parent with the frame shift or knockout. And uh, what you see here is that the intensity of the ChIP-seq signal at this plus one histone um, is going down. So we observed that the location of the H2AZ didn't change. The peak positions were maintained, but the, uh, pr the efficiency of the H2AZ deposition went down. OK, um, so I want to go to the conclusions. One thing was the, the scary number of epistatic uh, protein QTLs we found um, in this the protein study. Um, interesting was the, this consistent effect we had of several QTLs impacting the same pathway. Um, important was also the observation that non-coding RNAs are probably as important for explaining eQTLs as coding genes. Um, this widespread antisense transcription was really interesting. Um, that's something we have to, to check. I mean, antisense eQTLs have been investigated in other species, so I don't think this is uh, restricted to this particular cross. And then we, uh, we detected this quite interesting allele of SWC5. In fact, I don't even understand why these cells are still alive, because the phenotype is quite strong, but they're growing, and uh, there's also a knockout strain that grows. Um, okay, so. Here are the acknowledgments. Um, these are the people from my group, especially Mathieu Clement Zizah. He was the leading person for both of the projects that I was showing. And here are our external collaborators and the funding sources. So thank you very much. Thank you for staying on time. We're going to take questions. Go ahead. What fraction of your peak QTLs are actually also explained by the RNA sequence levels, mm -hmm. QTLs? Yeah, and could we you didn't comment about the differences? Yeah, we didn't do that comparison. So there, there are uh, RNA data available for the same cross, but they were done by Rachel Bram and other people in, in Leonid's group. So I don't, we don't think the data is directly comparable. So what we're currently doing is um, we are, in fact, repeating the protein measurements with a newer technology from Rudy, and then in parallel we're doing RNA sequencing and uh, from the same samples, aliquots from the really the same samples, and I think then we will be in the position to answer this question much better. Next question. So you pointed out that it random for us you can capture interactions between predictors. Can you estimate the proportion or the contribution of epistasis to your true positive predictions? Yes, and the protein study was one third. One third. Next yeah. question. Thank you. Um, a follow up on that. Uh, so, so that was a protein study for targeted uh, mm -hmm. S SRM assays. Do you think that proportion of epistasis was affected by your choice in proteins to assay? We don't think so. We did an, um, a number of uh, analysis using, for instance, the RNA data, which is available for the same cross, and then we performed the same selection procedure on the RNA data, and then we didn't see an enrichment of epistatic interactions. But you, you're never sure. I mean, the sele we selected the proteins to be variable between the strains, so we expected a lot of QTLs. Um, but we don't see why that should bias us for more epistatic QTLs. But even, even if there was a bias, I mean, these proteins are important for explaining also the physiological trait variations between the strains, like growth rates and so on. So ultimately, this is really what, is, what matters, right? Yeah, the other quick question is with the, the SWIC5, so you, you really didn't see a cellular phenotype for something with that large an effect um, in, in your molecular data? 
uh, you're talking about the fission yeast uh, study, yeah. the second one. Yeah, we, we see actually there's a growth, growth a QTR at the same locus. So it is affecting growth, but it would I mean, they're still alive. That is the surprising thing. But there's certainly an effect, yeah. So you made a comment about a random forest and why we're not using it, why the rest of the world doesn't use it. So <laughs> I can tell you why we're not using it, because it's computationally impossible to, to run it in the time frame no, that no, it, in humans. I'm not no, talking about yeast. No, no, no actually, we, we, we ran it on human data. But in your case, you're looking at cis EQTLs, and I think then it mm -hmm. really doesn't matter. I can tell you that everybody that has run it took log fault, many log fault uh, uh, difference to the timing that it takes. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure what kind of time frame you have in mind mm -hmm. in terms of EQTL analysis, mm -hmm. but we're looking running the whole genome in like a couple of hours. So mm -hmm. I don't think that compares. The second thing is I want you to comment on the resolution of actually pink, that now going to single variants and assessing functional properties as opposed to just discovering a region mm -hmm. that is likely to be an EQTL, which is a whole other issue that needs to be relevant to what exactly we're trying to do with EQTL analysis. So how, how much of a resolution does your random, random forest analysis give you on single variant properties as opposed to just discovering a region that is an EQTL? Okay, so this is actually not related to the mapping method you're using, so it doesn't matter whether you use random forest or anything else. What matters is the genetic resolution that you have in the population. And uh, if you do this kind of model crosses, then the genetic res resolution is usually lower than in a human outbreads population. So that, that's really the key factor here. Um, so you have higher statistical power, but lower resolution um, because you have fewer variants or free, fewer uh, haplotypes, essentially, between the populations. So that's what, what really matters. Yeah, 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 but, but the, the, method, the mapping method doesn't affect your resolution. I don't see why. We can talk about this offline, but I don't see how the mapping could affect your, your resolution. I have a question about your inversion region. So, I mean, because you're using your random forest approach, you would expect mm -hmm. that any of the variants within this large region would, in fact, be informative. Did you, in fact, find that they are providing independent contribution? Or, basically, if you condition on each of them, did you find that the other ones were still useful? Because it is possible that, that just this one large inversion of just the disruption of that one gene could be, in fact, explaining all of this trans band that you found. Yes. Um, so at the edges of, the, of this inversion region, you have the largest number of QTLs. And that, that makes sense because at the, essentially the breakpoints of the chromosome, you expect the largest perturbation of, for instance, um, gene expression and so on. But then inside the region, you have additional polymorphisms which gives us additional resolution. Therefore, it's not the whole region, just one QTL. It's, so therefore, you have this substructure in this region. So when you do the conditional analysis, there's a lot of variance left to explain. Well, the, so we only did an explicit conditional analysis using this other transband on chromosome 3. Um, but, and then we didn't see any difference, because random forest is basically accounting for the conditionality, because you have this tree structure. So mm -hmm. it's taking this into account anyway. No, I, I understand, but basically, mm -hmm. because you have a forest, not just a tree, mm -hmm. there's a lot of repeated features across your different trees. So, um, yeah. yeah so but we see the we see this resolution anyway. That's so. interesting. <coughs> okay. Thank you again.